So thanks for the introduction. It is an honor it's in, and a pleasure uh, to be here and share part of the message. The talks that you've already heard this morning uh, have been re a really good lead in. I, I can pick up uh, right right from there uh, and go with you know, presenting this as a, as a paradigm shift, classic paradigm shift issue, uh, where we have a certain way of thinking. Uh, we realize that things aren't fitting that anymore. We identify these as anomalies. The anomalies amount up to the point where we hit crisis, which I think we're approaching now. Uh, and then new paradigms start emerging and are proposed. Uh, the old paradigm starts dying out once you pass the crisis point. Uh, the old paradigm is dead, but not completely dead until the old people that supported the old paradigm actually die. Uh, <clears throat> that's the nature of paradigm shift. I think the new paradigm uh, that we have is really landscape level uh, thinking, and it comes, comes out in our language. It's already come out some a little bit uh, this morning. In terms of the thought of uh, fire as a, as a point thing, as, a, as an incident in space and time uh, that could be suppressed or, or isn't, and, and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to push you a little bit more into the mindset uh, that fire is just a phenomenon that flows in time and space across the landscape. And if you get more comfortable with that concept, I think we'll be able to deal with some of the issues that, that we're going to deal with today and over the next couple days a little bit better, That's rather than thinking of it as uh, discrete little things. So that kind of that kind of landscape and time thinking, and with this preparedness message, you know, thinking about uh, just just your the probabilities and the exposure kind of issue, which you know the depressing news has already uh, been presented. If you want to be even more depressed, bring a pathologist into uh, the discussion or an entomologist. Then that's a real bummer. You know, get them and the climate folks going. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, or, or the exotic, in, invasive exotic species, then you know you're going to die. Uh, but anyway, uh, so think about those, those probabilities and just your exposure to it, uh, how sensitive you, you, uh, your property, your 15 hectares, uh, your community, uh, the, the landscape, how sensitive is it to this flow of fire uh, coming in and out, and what kind of adaptations you can make. And I, I really, I'm first and foremost a civil culturist, uh, and so, I want to present that idea that you know, there is part of this dynamic that we can manage, the fuels part that's already come up. Uh, and there's some very promising things that we can do there to help adapt. I'm going to present this issue of fuels and biomass as a reservoir that we have accumulated over the last century uh, on our landscapes. Uh, and as a beaver uh, in the College World Series, baseball, the Canadians play baseball? Yeah, okay, so yeah, that's my beeves. I know. You play, you play soccer? Did you make the world? Oh, you didn't make the World Cup either. So let's, let's talk, yeah. Let's talk about that one over lunch. Uh, but being a beaver, I had to, you know, attribute uh, the, the, the slide up here and uh, you know, show a beaver pond in there. In reality, this is a big ass. Uh, reservoir of biomass uh, out there now on the on the landscape, uh, and a reservoir that's going to spill uh, one one way or another, uh, particularly as we move into the future. And, and you've seen the projections uh, for that. So let's let's get started uh, on it. Uh, what you know? What are these anomalies that have been building up towards crisis? Uh, the, the first is that we've ignored this natural role of fire. It's come up this morning with the traditional ecological knowledge and all. A lot of this landscape, and I'm sure I'm not familiar uh, with this beautiful landscape here, a great drive in yesterday. Um, but I, I think everything that I looked at, uh, every, every ecosystem from Spokane up, uh, is, was a, a fire-prone, fire-loving uh, ecosystem, uh, everything that I saw. And that goes back 10,000, 15,000 years, lots of indigenous burning in addition to lightning ignitions and that kind of stuff. It was largely a fuel-limited landscape, so they had hot, dry, windy conditions, but they didn't live in fear of them because they, they managed, our, our predecessors managed their landscape. We largely changed that 100 or so uh, years ago, uh, ignoring that basic role of fire. And we can go into a lot of evidence and fire scars and, and vegetation types and reconstructions. If we need to uh, over lunch, you can pick that battle. I'm going to win that battle, uh, though, because the, the evidence is past convincing about how important fire was in the evolution of these forest types, these veg types, 
uh, this planet in general, uh, humans uh, as a species. Uh, they elevated this issue of the reservoir, the elevated hazard that we have out. Ha hazard is just, in this case, the biomass that's stacked out there. Uh, most of the hectares out there have more fuel than they've ever had on them. Uh, some of those vegetation communities and forest types haven't actually existed before. Uh, and, you know, we've packed so much new biomass and the structural, comp the species composition and the structural stacking uh, that we have created in the last century out there has never existed before. Uh, so that hazard is there and probably more alarming is those hectares are better connected than they've ever been one to the next. And so this was part of that message as well when you were looking at the Wadland Urban Interface and what you can do on your property. Yes, it's important what you do on your hectare, uh, but that fits within a larger context. And actually the risk uh, of, for your, your property burning actually has more to do with where you are in that landscape than necessarily the fuel, the hazard that's sitting uh, right, right on your property. So think about that. So let's cross into that issue of risk. It's a, there's an elevated risk as well because of this climate signal, uh, because of the continuity of those fuels, because of the increased ignitions uh, out there. All of, all of those probabilities are cranking up. Fire is flowing more easily through the landscape, so that raises the probability that it encounters your particular point uh, in time. And we typically have more value associated with each of those hectares uh, as well. And whether it is, you know, your property, your house, or watershed, or scenery, or wildlife habitat, or fiber, or carbon, uh, what, you know, whatever it is uh, out there, uh, it, is, it is all those things at once. When we walk outside and look up at that hillside, it is all those things at one time, and it is also fuel. It is all those things at one time, and it is fuel, and it will burn. All right. So my predecessors perhaps promised you and, and painted the notion uh, that it, it wasn't going to burn. Smokey Bear, Walt Disney, you know, what Americans in general <clears throat> promised you, promised you, uh, or somehow painted this illusion uh, that it, it, there, there is a future where it, where it doesn't burn. And I'm sorry, and, and I will apologize for them, even though I had nothing to do with it. Although I fought fire. Uh, as, as a, a student at Virginia Tech many years ago. Uh, and so, yeah, my name's John. I suppressed fire. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, we created, we created that illusion that it doesn't necessarily burn. And that's really what we're learning in the last 10 or 20 years, uh, is that it's going gonna, it's gonna to burn anyway. It's going to burn anyway. So we, we ignore that natural role of history. We have elevated hazard out there. We have elevated risk. And now you've heard the climate change. I put a little asterisk by there because in my country, you know, Matt, Paul Hesburgh tomorrow knows it uh, as well. We're not actually allowed to use those words, uh, at least if we want to go back home. Uh, so we're going to use crispy conifer. Uh, since I can't use the acronym CC, we're going to use crispy conifer as the code word for what I have up there on the slide. Uh, so we've had plenty of that message uh, now that that's coming, and so it's only going to get worse. It's snowpack, it's fire season, it's, it's temperature, all that kind of stuff. This, this is the, the Dr. Doom things, and uh, we can argue about it, uh, but I think it's, it's pretty well uh, stated. And I'll, I'll actually skip over this because there's even more updated information, and we've talked about it. Uh, but I will put an accent on the two-fold, three-fold, five-fold, I heard six-fold uh, as, as well. Uh, you know, when, we, when you think about uh, perhaps your salary, uh, you might get really excited about a 5% increase uh, or get very excited about a 20% increase. How many of you would like a five-fold increase in your salary? You know, that is the, ma <laughs> that is the magnitude uh, that we are talking about for our children, a five-fold uh, increase in these things. All right, sorry to get back on that. That's the, that's the sad part. Uh, but something, something that you have to definitely have to think about it. The more truly uplifting part of it is that full fuels treatments uh, and planning around fuels treatments and everything, uh, we, we know that we can do that. 
Uh, we know how to do it. We have more tools and techniques than ever. Uh, and it's pretty clear that they are effective. After all, this, this burning and fire behavior, largely at least at the smallest scales of space and time, is just physics and chemistry. You know, so if we remove the fuels uh, on this hectare or change the distribution uh, of those, Physically and chemically, uh, fire burns differently. So it changes those probability, the fire behavior when it comes there, it changes the probabilities of how quickly it's going to spread as we try to match up. Yes, those most extreme weather conditions, and uh, it's funny, you know, we talk about the 97th percentile, 99th percentile, 100th percentile. Uh, you know, you even start thinking, you know, the 102nd percentile, the 105th percentile that, that the Australians are talking about now, because they're off the charts of, of things that they've seen before uh, in terms of temperatures and wind speeds and fire weather and fire behavior uh, and those kinds of things. So, so we even have to change our terminology around these, these percentiles and, and all those kinds of things. Uh, at those conditions, yeah, a lot of, a lot of stuff burns, but it, it changes the ultimate energetics and intensity of that fire that you get, and therefore it changes the severity, the impact that it's going to have uh, out there. And that's at a stand level. Uh, and so whether or not you're talking about the wildland urban interface or further up on the mountain sides or something, changes the intensity, changes the, uh, the severity, the impact that it's going to have. Uh, and we have a whole toolbox, silviculturally speaking, uh, of mechanical and chemical and, of course, prescribed burning approaches as well, whether or not it's management ignition uh, burning of piled material or broadcast burning. Uh, or that wildland fire use. Uh, what was it? I'm drawing a blank. What were you guys calling it earlier? When you when you resource benefit fire, the Americans have changed the name so many times. Prescribed natural fire, conservation fire, resource benefit fire, wildland fire use fire, appropriate use fire. I like that one. Appropriate use fire. That one's good. If we treat these, uh, if we treat the stands. Uh, and we do enough of that together, uh, we know now that we influence landscape level fire risk as well. We start influencing the flow of fire across the landscape. I use the analogy here of a, of a river you know, flowing, flowing down through a valley. Uh, if you only have you know, 1 percent, 5 percent, 10 percent of the course of the river blocked by logs or rocks, uh, then it doesn't really change the, the flow of the river. Uh, and so if we've only treated that percentage uh, of a landscape and, and fire is flowing down through there, the fire is just going to go around. I mean, the, those, those hectares will be a little different, but the fire is, just, is still just going to flow through that landscape, uh, just like you would in your canoe or kayak. Uh, it's not a big deal, that 5% rock and log out there. You can find a course, keep your speed, and keep going. Uh, somewhere around a third, 30%. Uh, of a river being blocked by rocks or logs, and you have to really start picking, picking your path. And, and it's going to slow the flow of the water, and it's going to slow your progress as a canoeist uh, through there. Uh, and up around two-thirds, 60-some percent of the river being blocked by rocks and logs, we know it doesn't even matter what the arrangement of those are. It's, it's going to start hampering the flow of the river, and you're going to end up portaging uh, your canoe some. So that, that's where we want to be. Less, less than about a third, we're not going to have any influence on landscape level fire flow. Above two thirds, doesn't matter what we do with them. The sweet spot is between the one third and the two thirds zone, where it really matters where we put those. And so that might be really important in our planning around the wildland urban interface, is really designing these fuels treatments uh, that we put out there. So that's really good news, right? We know energetically and chemically we can influence fire behavior with our stand level treatments. We know how much we need to do and how to arrange them to influence landscape level fire flow, and they pay for themselves. That data is just coming in now from the economists as they look at the at, uh, landscape level fire flow. Uh, the number for uh, you know, the 10 to 20 to 30, maybe $50 billion, that's Northern California alone. State of California last year, I'm hearing numbers, $1.5 trillion in property loss. It's just staggering amounts of, of money. So that, you know, it, that drives these analyses to show that we get a positive return on investment, even investing hundreds of dollars U.S. You know, per hectare to do these treatments. It's still, it still pays for itself in terms of the resistance and resilience and, and lack of property loss and those kinds of things. 
So also good news, it can happen, but, but our current systems, political systems, budgetary systems, uh, just cannot possibly match what's even accumulating in the landscape. The reservoir is actually getting deeper, uh, you know, even with the, the recent wildfire activity that we've had. Uh, we're, I mean, we're approaching a steady lake level, but generally it's still, it's still increasing. Uh, and these forest types are changing and that kind of stuff, constantly growing. They're growing out there today. We could go out and look up at the hillside and those damn trees and everything, they're growing again today. They're, they're, they're just, they're packing on more, more biomass. And then later this year, they're gonna be dry, I tell you. So uh, it's growing, it's growing, it's expanding all the time. We don't have the money. We have a terrible bureaucracy in place, bureaucracies in place. The politics just aren't there to get out and do the things that at least by the, by the end of these couple days, you're gonna know that you need to do and you're gonna struggle uh, to find the administrative rules, the social license, and all to do the things that you're gonna know that you need to do out there, and then you've gotta find the money uh, for them. Uh, even if it were there, we make someone king, uh, and, and turn them loose, me, I, I would like to be. Uh, wouldn't you like to have an American king? <laughs> I've got one. <laughs> Man. Now I am definitely not gonna be allowed back in the country. <laughs> All right. Uh, even, so even if we make someone king and get this going, uh, at least in much of the American West, and I think it, it's up here in British Columbia as well, we've lost a lot of our milling infrastructure and uh, equipment and operators and even truck drivers and that kind of stuff to move the amount of biomass that we're actually talking about. Uh, if we could really gear it up and go in next year. In reality, it's gonna take five or 10 years probably to turn that corner and build the community biomass plants to tap into the energy uh, or the sawmills to meet the wood needs of a growing population, you know, whatever we want to do. We need the markets and the infrastructure. Uh, and those first few waves of, of treatments that we put out there, the probability is that, the, that this year, next year's big fire is going to encounter those, will there be, therefore be low. And so it's going, to take us, it's going to take us five to 10 years also just to get enough to get that 30% or so of the landscape treated uh, so that we're actually starting to make a difference and see some of the returns on that investment. So this is, this is a commitment. Uh, and in the interim, Wild on Fire is going to continue uh, to expand because we, we have transition you know, from that fuel limited landscape that our predecessors had for tens of thousands of years uh, to climate driven fires. So you've, you've seen that, the hot, dry, windy days. You know, that's, that's the nature. The fuel is out, topography hasn't changed much. Uh, the fuels have accumulated and accumulated and accumulated. Uh, and now when we hit those really extreme fire weather events, that's what drives the fire behavior. And it's typically the first, second, third day, although I guess the, the projections now are they're gonna become four and five day uh, high wind, hot, dry conditions that are going to drive the initial spread of fire uh, out there. So that's going to make it our initial attack successes decline. Uh, they're going to get larger, faster, burn more severely those days that they're burning. And then, yes, we wait until the weather changes to finally, to finally get the things uh, put out. And with the consequence of that, as I'm going to show you, uh, is that the spatial and temporal pattern is changing on the landscape. So tomorrow, Paul Hesburgh is going to show you some of this historical and prehistorical patterning, 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 yes, that, uh, on the landscape and, and how things were arranged when fire is flowing through, through that landscape and that kind of a landscape memory that is developed over millennia. Uh, we're largely erasing that. With our, with our recent fire behavior. Uh, and that has to be alarming uh, as well to the ecologists uh, that are out there. And then uh, we have mixed ownership that you know, adds complications and losses as, as we have these expanded values uh, out there on the, on the landscape. And I show this example, this is industrial land uh, down in Western Oregon. Uh, this is a 15 year old Douglas fir plantation on industrial land that has 100 foot flame links and you know some of these fire whirls and everything coming off of it and you know that's not driven energetically you can't do that with 15 year old trees there's just not enough fuel there 
uh, for any weather conditions, much less these particular weather conditions. Uh, you know, these, this kind of fire behavior was driven by an accumulation of biomass that wasn't treated 15 years earlier uh, when the plantation was put into place. 